We like to talk about the past, present, and future of women's basketball. Jan Jensen, who is vital to all of it, is <laughs> your assistant coach at Iowa Locked on Women's Basketball. Starts now. Ogumba Wale for the win. You are Locked on Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Welcome to Locked on Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Magdal. I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. Over 170,000 of you showed up in November alone. We are on track to break that mark here in December. We show up for you six days a week talking about the past, present, and future of the game. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, it is not just me. It is the incredible team over at The Next, thenexthoops.com, where we have over 100 reported pieces on women's basketball every single month. Subscribe there for $9 a month, $72 a year. It all goes to our writers, our editors, our photographers, who are all over the country and, in fact, all over the world covering this great game. And I am very excited to bring you this conversation. It's one uh, Jan and I were talking offline before this. By the way, not assistant coach, associate head coach. And let's be clear about that. And you're going to get into a lot of the details why. uh, But coach, the place we got to start, obviously, is that scoring dynamo with an Iowa background, the one everyone should be talking about. And that is, of course... Dorcas Anderson, your <laughs> winner of the state title in 19. 19- absolutely, absolutely. I gotta, I gotta show you here. Please, you know, please her, This is um, back in when I went in. This is her actually. Whoa, I get that right. So that's Dorcas. Her. She was a, uh, that's a biblical name. In case people don't know Dorcas in the Bible, but she, um, her parents not immigrated from Denmark. Mm -hmm. So she spoke a little Danish growing up and uh, in the clippings I found, she was the MVP in the 1921 state tournament. And uh, she was nicknamed Lottie because she scored a lot of points. I love that. So uh, she went into the hall of fame um, when I was just a youngster. And then I went in in 1993, which Mm -hmm. is um, the last year of six on six in Iowa. And my grandmother, that picture was taken about two years before she, uh, she passed away at 95. So I was um, really, really blessed or I think maybe it was 93. But anyway, I had to show you when you you mentioned her, I thought I had that picture right here in my office. So that is definitely the past near and dear to my heart. Zero regrets about bringing that up and seeing that I can tell you. Great, great. (laughs) But but again, it, it is so interesting to me. And we'll get into this a little later as it relates to Caitlin Clark, and the fact that there's a lot of conversation about kind of just discovering the game that we know has been thriving for over a century. Mm -hmm. Uh, To be part of that tradition, part of the Iowa six on six tradition, you know, part of, you know, the, the Molly Tasmer machine gun Molly Mm -hmm. eras as well. And, and, and I mean, no disrespect to your grandmother, but you kind of put that 89 point performance to shame by having 105 (laughs) uh, yourself, you know, what do you see and how do you feel the way in which it, the game was played in Iowa six on six, that mm-hmm. fast paced game has helped set the tone for not only what you guys do at Iowa to this day, but really the way the modern women's game is being played. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, for me, that's what's so special is, you know, I grew up, you know, like most kids, right. You fall in love with a game and uh, I could have never have imagined that, you know, my love affair with an orange ball um, would have taken me to the heights it has or given me my, you know, what I mean by heights is I've gotten to travel. I played professionally. I get to work with young women every day. I'm not necessarily, you know, qualifying a height by a final four or a championship. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more so just the, um, the places I've gotten to see and all because, you know, I love shooting a ball. And when I was young, um, you know, it's kind of interesting now, a little bit full, full circle yeah. in the six on six days. Um, 
it was not unusual to have a high school girls gym capacity crowds. Mm -hmm. um, that just, it was a fun, fast paced game. Um, for the viewers, if you don't know, six on six, it was really basically two, two different games of three on three. If you were a shooter, you were called a forward. And if you were um, a defender, you were called, you were called the guard. So you never switched half court. So it was, if you were the shooter and I was a forward, we got two dribbles and after we scored, or if we missed, um, if we scored, the referees would advance the ball. So if you think of the partners, two refs, one would grab it out of the net, he'd throw it up to his partner, and then he would throw it to the other team shooters. Mm -hmm. And then they would proceed to play three on three. Nice. If you miss, the guards would dribble up, but everybody only got two dribbles. So in essence, it's a game of three on three on both sides. So if you were pretty, you know, pretty good offensively, you had an offensive minded coach, you could score pretty fast. And so even though defense does win championships and we definitely always need to improve our defense, the offense can really ignite a crowd, you know, the fast you score, the pace you, which you score. So I got into this basketball business, not understanding thoroughly until I got older that I had a grandmother that was pretty doggone good. Mm -hmm. And then we just score points, right? You know, she was nicknamed Lottie. I didn't know that till I was a senior in high school, mm -hmm. but then I scored a few points and then, you know, I had a great, so blessed with a great university career. Then I went overseas and we won the German cup and then we've just been playing. Yeah. So I think that that six on six foundation has been really special. Um, and I think it does all kind of tie into my love of it. Uh, but then to choose to stay in this state that have, was so supportive to me personally and a small community, um, but in a state that I think really understands it's female sports yeah. and they've always supported it for the most part. Um, that has been special to always be able to, to get to stay here. So I feel like I've been tremendously blessed professionally, uh, personally, and um, just being at the university of Iowa has been, you know, amazing. And at Drake, I had, you know, two, two great stops. I would be remiss not to point out to our viewers that when you say you scored a couple of points, that understates it a little bit. <laughs> I mean, average 66 a game in high school, and uh, I believe north of 29 per game yeah. during your time at Drake as well. So it is important yeah. to <laughs> understand I that. I never met a shot I didn't like, Howard. You know, we all knew our roles, right? We, you know your roles, and I just <laughs> happen to have a fun one. <laughs> well, and, and and what I love, and and this has always been so interesting to me, is the way in which your identity as a player ties into the way these Iowa teams play together. And, you know, before we get into kind of the arc of how you got here and your work where, you know, you played for Lisa, of course, right. before yep. starting on her staff. When you think about the way in which you build specifically Iowa Bigs, which is, I know, a point of mm -hmm. emphasis for you, mm -hmm. how much of it comes down to thinking about recreating a lot of that offensive flow because certainly we see you know first of all iowa bids you know they're going to score the ball at an elite rate and whether it's made in gustafson or monica's or many who have come before or since who we'll get into as well it, there is an efficiency there to score the basketball that puts you guys at or near the top if you look at all the offensive metrics every single season do you think that those lessons just directly tie to that legacy as well you know, I, I think so. I think now that I've, you know, we're kind of, you know, the arc of our careers, yeah. um, you know, I, I feel like in six on six, the goal was to be really efficient, right? Cause you had, you only had two dribbles and you had three people on a side, right? So it was three on three and you were trying to score as quickly as possible and you couldn't waste dribbles mm -hmm. and you, you know, it, high percentage shooting, you know, if we're closer to the basket, I just feel like, well, we should make most of them, right? <laughs> You're close. So, you know, the three pointers, the farther out we go, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think there was, you know, a, maybe a subconscious influence. Um, I just like efficient, pretty basketball. And so does Lisa. And I think, um, you know, that's what makes our game so beautiful. Uh, some people, you know, they coach, you know, they have 70 different plays, 150 different sets, and, you know, they want to call it and control it. 
Um, some of us like motion where you teach them to you teach them to play and you teach them to read a little harder to scout in the sense that we're not always knowing what reads are going to make, but in easier because we don't have 70 plays. Right. Um, but I think efficient basketball, especially on the inside, um, is is fun and it's quick to watch. And I think you can trace that back to the six on six game. It is glorious to watch. It's always a point of personal privilege. Oh, but when we come back in segment two, we're going to talk about your path and your path with Lisa Bluter as well. I'm so delighted uh, that you're here with us. To our listeners, you are listening to Locked on Women's Basketball. But first, very excited to talk to you about the folks over at eBay Motors who are doing something interesting over with our team at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. So the host there is Josh Lloyd, and he gives you the best fantasy picks each week, all season long there. Whether you're preparing for a daily draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week they're going to provide some players that are a guaranteed fit on your roster. So Josh, this week is eBay guaranteed fit fantasy players of the week include Terry East and James Weissman, Maliki Branham over in the NBA. The one I especially want to highlight is Grayson Allen. If you look at Grayson Allen this year, Bradley Beal's been out and Allen has actually taken his efficiency up another notch. He's a career 40% three-point shooter. He's at 46 so far this year. You can expect him to see strong minutes going forward and a nice increased usage rate over the next few weeks. Josh Lloyd from Locked On Fantasy Basketball is helping you win your fantasy championship. And eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. The same goes with your vehicles. Now, I don't know a lot about cars, but that's okay because eBay Motors does. They have over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack bumpers, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. At these prices, you can't afford not to do it. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. So back with Jan Jensen, and I want to take us back, if we can, to that period of time where you transition from playing to coaching and coaching and working on Lisa's staff. There was a period of time in the late 90s into the early 2000s where Lisa makes the transition from Drake to Iowa. You faced a choice. Your choice was take the head job at Drake or continue on as an empowered staff member with Lisa at Iowa. Take me through your thinking about that, your decision-making process, and ultimately how you arrived at this conclusion. Yeah, you know, I think we all have different crossroads, right, in, in our life, and that was a big one, uh, relatively young. And I think when I had, um, you know, when I got, you know, presented that opportunity, um, I felt like I had grown up at Drake, Right. I came from high school. I was at, you know, it was fun high school career and I chose to stay in Iowa and I had a, you know, great support from my hometown and then Des Moines community, Des Mo you know, they supported our Drake teams. And then I went overseas and played professionally. And then Lisa took a chance on me as a really young coach. Um, I mean, I was really, really blessed because I won the German cup and I felt like, you know what, that was, I mean, very few often do you get to end a season as the, the champ. That was the only time in my career. And I thought, what a great way to segue into my next stage of life, which I want to get my master's at Drake. And I wanted to be a president of a small liberal arts college mm. or university. I had a great influence uh, in my life. The, his name was Don Adams. He was the VP of student affairs at Drake. And he kind of helped me with our life goals. So I thought, oh, I'm going to come back. I'm going to be a GA. And I'd love to play, you know, love to still work with basketball. So I came back. And then right when I came back after Europe, uh, one of her assistants got the Ambrose job, which is where Lisa came from. Right. So she was, you know, open a real or full-time assistant. 
So she opened the search, didn't really know anybody because, I mean, she knew some people, but she was still a pretty young coach at the D1 level. Mm -hmm. So she knew some people, but then you're, you're kind of, uh, her pool wasn't as big as it certainly is now. Right. So she interviewed a lot of people and just was like, not quite certain, you know, just didn't really hit. So she went to our administration and said, Hey, I believe in Jan. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, she'd be a great coach and I want someone in this position that I really can trust. She knows my system, blah, blah, blah. Well, so I got to start out in this, you know, wonderful, crazy business, um, just learning everything right away. So I think that loyalty started when she coached me. I had a really great senior year, but then when she took a chance on me at such a young age. So then we had a lot of success eventually in the eight years I was there as a coach and we had, you know, gone to the NCAA tournament, won the Missouri Valley. Yeah. And I felt like you could kind of seem a little different shift going on. You know, the power fives were really coming in hard with the football money and more TV money. Um, not that the mid-majors, if there's anybody that loves and respects mid-majors, it would be Lisa, myself, and Jenny Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. We love Drake. We would cancel that game if we if we could, uh, just because we don't like to play against our my alma mater. And Jenny Fitzgerald on staff was also a Drake player, sure. uh, older than me. So Lisa did not coach her. But anyway, I just felt like, man, that's a fun challenge to go to the Big Ten. And Lisa, of course, wanted me to go. She's a pretty good recruiter. And uh, I just felt like, you know, I'd spent my, you know, four years of my life at Drake growing. And then I came back and I was a coach growing and learning. I thought, you know, if I don't leave now, maybe I'll never leave. Mm -hmm. And so then I went with Lisa, but it was really hard. It was emotional. And you know, it felt like you were a traitor, right? Because I used to be the big bad guys and blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, unequivocally, it was certainly a wonderful decision. Uh you know, for my personal life, professional life. And then when we hit a year, you know, we've had so many great years, but I think everybody who coaches, right. You know, when you're young, you think you're going to go to every final four, like Pat Summit did and Gino did. Then you coach for a few years and you think, wow, they're really impressive as many times as they've been there. Right. So um, the plans, the, you know, things shift, you know, what you want to do as a coach and what you want to get out of it, but what you really want to put into it. And that was, you know, Lisa, myself and Jenny are we're always so like minded in in what we wanted to hopefully do and positively impacting the young women we coach and win and wherever that takes us, what level. So to last year, um, you know, to really get to that point in time, um, it's indescribable. You know, I'm just really grateful. Um, you know, we want to do it again, certainly. But I think any coach will tell you, you know, just tasting it once is um you just feel so fortunate because there's so many great players and so many amazing coaches that they just don't quite get to that moment. And uh, so I feel very thankful we'll forever have had that. And had I stayed at Drake, you know, I don't know, um, maybe a lot of other great things would have happened, but uh, Lisa and I and Jenny sharing that was certainly um, a blessing that really will, you know, just, I really can't describe how much that meant. It's enormous. And and like you said, it, it is arguably harder than ever. We keep seeing the game make these evolutionary leaps, you know, beyond uh, year in and year out, which is wonderful to see. I do want to talk about that, uh, especially yeah. in segment three. I would be remiss, though, not to point out, and this is a part of your story. You talked about professional and personal life that Lisa did at the time that I, I I don't I don't think it gets talked about enough. And I think it is so significant when we think about the arc and what has made Iowa such a special place. And that is the fact that you came to Lisa and offered to resign over your sexuality. The idea at that time, and we've had other coaches on the program who talked about this time, that at this time that there was negative recruiting that was happening, that the LGBTQ community had not made the gains that we mm -hmm. see today, uh, though the work is by no means finished. Mm -hmm. and when you went to Lisa and offered to resign, just take me through what that moment was like for you and what it was like to hear and to be empowered by how mm -hmm. supportive she was of you in that moment. Well, I think that's always the, the trick when you're not the boss, you know, and I think that's the thing, you know, um, you know, if it's your own program, right. Even it just, it impacts so many people. Right. And you don't want to, everybody's, you know, working really, really hard. And, um, 
you just you just don't want to be uh, negative. And so um, I wasn't surprised of Lisa's reaction. You're grateful for it. Um, but, you know, that was, boy, now, what are we talking, 28 plus years ago. Yeah. And times have changed. Certainly, you know, the world still has so much division, whether it's politically, uh, ethnic, um, uh, golly, you know, uh, black, white, all of it. Yeah. Um, and there's still going to be pockets of, you know, people that are going to negatively recruit it. Um, but, you know, there were so many people that come before us that, you know, couldn't be, you know, living their lives and being own, honest and open and so forth. So I just felt it was, um, you know, important to just, you know, come out of the gates and be someone that was trying to be just who they are and, um, you know, have a strong faith. And sometimes that doesn't always gel with some people who are against you. Um, but I, I felt like that really had seen me through and has always been incredibly blessed. And, um, so we just decided this is the way we're going to roll. And, um, you know, just my style is just to be kind of who I am. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in any, any cause, if you will, you know, everybody's got to kind of take their place in that, in that, um, the line, you know, some people are at the forefront, some people are in the back, some people are, you know, in the middle. Um, so I just, you know, tried to do the best I could and, um, you know, be strong and be confident and, uh, in their coming out process, everybody's is different. So it's just nice. Everybody will tell you, um, just to have a good support team around you. And, um, so that was, um, certainly, you know, a small part of our story. Um, but it was very, very important one. And, um, coming over here, um, I'm very thankful because it was that point in time where I think a lot of other coaches, you know, hadn't ever dared to ask different questions or just kind of proceed, uh, partly because of how the world was, you're worried about your jobs, worried about, you know, um, you know, people not going to support you. Um, but we were able to make some changes on, you know, my family could travel, right. My spouse traveled in our first NCAA tournament and some things were becoming a little more normal. Um, so I feel like I was really blessed to then give back and try to, in your own way, just live a life that all the other people had been living and their families could enjoy, you know, your families are with you. If you're in anything in life, mm. whether you're a big CEO um, or a coach or, you know, uh, uh, you're working at a, a gas station, if you have a good day or a bad day, if you have a good support team, your family is there. And so to be able to come to Iowa and, and have the tough days supported, but then when we made it to the promised land, your family could go. Um, I think that was something that I'm always grateful for is um, in my growth, I had the confidence to continue to try to make it better. And I think, uh, I feel like that's why God's really put me here is just whatever I'm doing is trying to leave it in a better place. And uh, I've certainly been blessed and hopefully I'm, I'm going to leave it in a better place when, when it's all said and done. Well, without question, your bravery and Lisa's uh, willingness to stand up for what was right has resonated in the basketball world here for all that's come. So we're going to talk uh, in segment three about that. Uh, really excited to be back with Jan Jensen in just a moment. But first, I'm going to talk to you guys about game time. And of course, we talk about game time on a regular basis about being able to get the tickets that are hard to come by. So it is entirely appropriate that we do this as we are talking about Iowa basketball, because if you want to be able to see this greatest show in college basketball, you better get over to game time where you have the opportunity to select your tickets in the secondary market. If you want to go get them from the box office at Rutgers on January 5th, you cannot. If you want to go get it at the box office at Maryland on February 3rd, you cannot. And so not everyone is credentialed like me. And if you want to get in the door, make sure you go to game time. You have an opportunity to not just get the tickets, but to see where it is you're going to sit. So download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off. Sure, music, theater, all, all those things are available. But most important, obviously, 
make sure you're getting your women's basketball tickets and Dame Time's a way to do it. Download Dame Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I, I will tell you, as a point of personal privilege, I am taking my younger daughter, who is basketball obsessed, to that game on February 3rd. And she needs to know exactly the view that she's going to get for Caitlin Clark. She is very excited about that. That's you know. awesome. We appreciate that. Thanks yeah. for bringing her. Oh, can, now, can, can can I start recruiting her yet or not? You, She is. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that. She is a class of 32. She is okay. big. She, if we we yes. be very yes. happy, the Magdal family. <laughs> if she gets to work with you someday, we will be very happy. All right, I'm excited. I hope I I'm, hope I'm still there. That that's the goal is to be able to stick around as long as we have. So that's my goal now. I'm going to try to coach that big. I love it. I, we cannot wait for that day. But in the meantime, we should probably talk about the 23 24 team, which also, go. much like my daughter, has sort of a limitless ceiling. And I do want to talk. Obviously, there's a lot of conversation about Caitlin Clark. There's what she is in the broader culture. And I do wonder what that means to you, to somebody who excelled in, obviously, in a different way, the shape of your game, mm -hmm. but to a similar extent, to see what it means to not just succeed on the court like she has, but succeed in those numbers that we see, whether it's the 10 million, whether it's the sellouts, where, wherever you're going. You know, what do you think it says about where the game is and where it's going? You know, I, that's one thing that we're, we're just so excited about and it's not lost on us. You know, I told Lisa the other day, you know, the trick is to enjoy this amazing moment in time while managing the pressure to win. Because I think any women's basketball coach, especially as long as we've done it, I mean, it, it can choke you up every time. I mean, every time I walk into our arena on a sell, you know, on a sold out day, right is your part of you has the wonderment and the, the disbelief still because you spend your whole life just trying to get people to just watch. And my whole thing, you know, when I was just a young one out of college is trying to get people not to look at the game and compare men to women, just watch both and enjoy both. Right. They're very similar, but they're different. And you don't have to, you know, critique the one to make the other better or, you know, critique a guy's team making, you know, oh man, the women's team is so much better than you got, you know, all of that. I've, I've never, ever liked that. Yeah. And so we were just, man, we would go to every rotary club. You go to every church, you know, bazaar, you'd go everywhere to just speak. If they'd let you have 10 minutes to say, Hey, Hey, come and see our, our women. You know, the thing that's been beautiful about the women's game, which people sometimes it resonated with them is that when young girls were playing it mm -hmm. and then got a scholarship to play and then, you know, were able to, you know, get this full ride is just, you're so grateful because we're not chasing the LeBron James money. We can't. Mm -hmm. Right. So when people would start to follow and watch us, we're so grateful you're watching because women have started and played because they loved it. And their sole pursuit has been, how good can I get? How how great can I become? And for years, no one was really writing about us. Now, our state was better. But overall, USA Today's, New York Times, po whatever, yeah. like they, they didn't care because society wasn't caring. But women just kept going. We just kept going. It's just because there was joy in playing. There was the the just the intrinsic driven goals. And yeah. to me, there's beauty in that when you're not going to play to like, you know, sometimes guys, they just expect people, you know, right. just expect sellouts. You know, you just expect that people are going to pay attention because, and so when women, when we would ever get a big crowd way back when we were at Drake and we, you know, we built that with some pretty good crowds, had a couple of sellouts at our time at Iowa building it. Uh, when we had the great Megan Gustafson, we had a couple of sellouts with her. Sam logic was seven, eight years ago. Yeah. So it, it, there has been moments, but now when you have a Caitlin Clark, you know, the right time, I mean, talk about timing and NILs and collectives, and then this brash player that does things that you don't, you just don't see very many doing with the exception of Steph Curry with his unconscious shooting. Mm -hmm. So all of that perfect storm, but to get, to get to have a 
a really genuine moment in time because you're part of it. I mean, I'm, I, I just, some days I just, you know, I thank the good Lord that it's our team that Caitlin, we were able to, to be a part of that a, a set, but I do think it's all part of the, the plan. I think it's all part of our process of appreciating the journey and not worrying about when it's going to end. A lot of times people, they're like, well, you know, Caitlin, she goes this year and next year. And I'm like, yeah, she's going to go sometime. I mean, at least, you know, at least we we, we're going to have her now. Enjoy the here and now. Right. I mean, there's only one Michael Jordan, but North Carolina kept going, you know, it's, it's, and so you just got to enjoy the ride, you know? So I'm, I'm thrilled and to see Maryland sold out, Rucker sold out. I mean, we're living a dream every day, every day. And it's, it's something that we're so grateful for because it's society, it's better. Um, but, you know, I still see a lot of women's games when I turn on some pretty good teams and they don't have fans. So it's, uh, I think we're place and time. I think our state's great. I think the Big Ten Conference does support its teams. No um, other schools in the big, or I mean, obviously they're selling out. Yeah, part of it is certainly the success of a Caitlin and our team, but they got some pretty good teams, you know. Brenda Fries knows a thing or two about championships, right? She does. Um, so it's just, we're just really blessed that we're here at this point in time. And the trick will be this year to keep trying to be successful and then next year and the year after and year after that. Um, life moves, life changes, and we're going to try to keep this women's basketball excitement going and the support of women in general going. And I think all of us that are part of that, that's our mission. You know, if I, if I'm another coach, I mean, I want to get another Caitlin Clark, you know, I want to do it at my school. I want to like, you know, that's, that's what we, we got to be doing. We got to be for each other as we beat each other. That makes sense. It does. It does. And it is a beautiful thing to see. It is a crest of a wave is the way I always think about it. Yeah. It yeah. A like a Caitlin Clark. But then when the wave recedes, making sure that the tide is coming in further than it did the last time. And that's the absolutely. Way absolutely. And there is. I, I am. I am not worried about where the tide is going to be for Iowa women's basketball, given where you were before Caitlin, given where you are now and given where you'll be after uh, Jan Jensen, an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I hope we get to do it again really soon. Well, I feel honored. Thank you for having me. And I know Lisa Fluter always enjoys the time. And uh, thanks for all you and your team do for women's sports, uh, women's basketball. We're greatly appreciated or appreciative. And uh, I'm just, like I said, I really appreciate it being on. And it was an honor. We, we love every second of it. So thank you to our listeners. Thank you for showing up for us. We have another one tomorrow. The great Jen Hatfield will be with us. We're going to be talking Ivy League basketball, talking about a tide that's rising, Columbia, Princeton, but don't miss out on Brown and Dartmouth. Much more to come. Until then, I am Howard Magdal wishing all of you a wonderful Wednesday. Welcome to Wallet. For the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball.